So in dysbiosis, bacteria are living in disharmony. So you have bacteria A, B, and C, and bacteria A decides to overpopulate and become more dominant over B and C. And so now they're not living in harmony anymore. And that's when um, they will usually at that point trigger a host response because your body is going to try and get them back into harmony or into symbiosis. And so your host response kicked in with your inflammatory cells. So control of microbial growth. Bacteria living in the biofilm are more resistant to antibiotics than free floating bacteria because they have that protective matrix um, surrounding them. It's more difficult to kill the bacteria in the biofilm. Antimicrobials work best in tandem with mechanical disruption. So if you were to just take, um, say, a, a Listerine product and decide to swish it around in your mouth, you might be able to kill the free-floating bacteria pretty easily with the Listerine. But the biofilm, the bacteria that are hiding underneath that protective covering, are going to be able to shield away from the Listerine. Um, when you use mechanical disruption, or in other words, you brush your teeth and you floss, you're disrupting that protective matrix and that biofilm, and then the antimicrobial rinse can get in and kill those bacteria that are now exposed and no longer protected. Physical removal includes brushing, flossing, or even perinatal instrumentation. Bacteria can be transmitted from the oral cavity um, of one person to another. There's little evidence that periodontal infections are communicable. Kissing is the primary means by which, which saliva and bacteria contents are transmitted. So just because the bacteria is transmitted from one mouth to the next does not mean that it's going to become um, a destructive bacteria. Oftentimes what happens is your host um, response kicks in, it recognizes the bacteria, it goes in, it attacks the bacteria and kills them, or um, they're disrupted and they're never allowed to colonize. And so we've pretty much determined that um, you are not going to get periodontitis from kissing somebody that has periodontitis. This is a chart that shows the bacteria. And on the next slide here, I defined some of the terms to help with the chart. Um, aerobic, these are just basic terms. Aerobic are relating to, involving, or requiring um, free oxygen. Aerobic bacteria need oxygen to survive, so they are weaker bacteria. Um, anaerobic are um, relating, involving, or requiring an absence of free oxygen, so they do not need oxygen um, to survive. Obligate anaerobes are microorganisms killed by normal atmosphere concentrations of oxygen, so they, they cannot survive in the presence of oxygen. Um, and then the facultative anaerobic anaerobes are organisms that can go either way. They can um, survive in oxygen, but they are also capable of surviving without oxygen because they obtain their energy in two different so from two different sources. So when you're looking at this chart and you look, the cocci are like your um, streptococcus. Those are your normal oral flora. They're the, the good bacteria. Um, they're usually, or they're always gram positive and um, they survive in either an oxygenated environment or they can survive um, in both environments. And then as you continue to grow over to gram negative, you'll notice you get into more of your anaerobic bacteria, you're more powerful. These are stained red, these are stained purple, gram positive, gram negative. Um, you've got rods, the rods get to be more potent. So as you're coming over to this column here, the more the really powerful ones, you've got your um, P. gingivalis and your P. intermedia, which are two very powerful, your tanorellas, those are your very powerful periodontal pathogens. So how do they colonize? So biofilm formation, these are colonies, what colonies of bacteria look like. So you can see that they're all attached to a surface or they're attached to each other. Some bacteria cannot directly attach to each other. So you've got bacteria A, B, and C. A and C cannot attach to each other. 
So B will sit as a bridge and bridge A and C together. So if A is attached to the tooth surface and C wants to attach to the tooth surface, but it can't attach to A in order to get there, B might come along, attach to A, and then C can attach to B. There are five stages of polymicrobial biofilm formation, poly being many microbial microbes. You have your initial attachment to pellicle, your permanent attachment, your maturation phase one, where they produce the self-protective matrix, then your maturation phase two, where they become mushroom-shaped stacked colonies, and then you have your stage five, which is dispersion. So in the initial, you can see down here, um, it inf uh, there's a film called a pellicle or acquired pellicle that forms on your teeth. This particular film is not bacterial. It is made of, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. Um, it's made of glycoproteins, salivary glycoproteins. So your saliva forms it and um, it covers your tooth. It forms right after you get your teeth cleaned. So it's not easily removed with toothbrushing. So you, it doesn't come off when you brush your teeth, but when you polish teeth, you remove this film and it reforms right away. Within a few hours, it reforms, or a few minutes, I'm sorry, within a few minutes, it reforms. Within a few hours, bacteria start to attach to it. So it ha it's, it's the good news and the bad news. The good news is it covers over the entire enamel surface of the tooth and it helps to keep acids off of the tooth, off of the enamel surface of a tooth. So it forms a little barrier. The bad news is it also attracts bacteria and it's what allows uh, microbes to attach themselves to the tooth. This is what pellicle looks like. You can't see it. This person just had their teeth cleaned. You can't see the pellicle formation. The tissues look perfectly healthy. And again, pellicle is not bacterial. It is made of um, proteins and glycoproteins. So it is um, it itself is not going to cause any gingival issues. The so stage two is the attachment stage down here. So the bacteria or the microbes are starting to attach to each other. Um, Coaggregation is the way they become attached to one another. They co-aggregate, they attach to each other, they co-mingle. Um, and if they're not removed by hydrodynamic forces or like um, any kind of um, saliva or um, any kind of curricular fluid or anything like that, they stay attached. Stage three is the maturation phase one, which is self-protective. So the matrix um, starts to form here. It's going to start to shield. You can see they're, they're bunching up here and it's in a protective matrix now. So they're harder to remove at this point. Um, they pr they're protected against your host generated immune defenses. So your body is going to start stimulating some um, immune cells and now they're kind of protected in their little matrix or their little cocoon. And this is how you start to get chronic disease, so chronic inflammation at this point. Then we go to stage four, the maturation phase two, where they become mushroom-shaped mushroom colonies. So the microbes cluster and form these microcolonies, um, and the species grow at an accelerated rate at this point. So are starting to reproduce rapidly and they're attracting more and more cells, um, bacterial cells to come to the area. Biofilm becomes thicker by stacking. So you can see how in this, how many are stacked on top of each other. So they're not just a single layer like they were back here. Now they're stacking outward into, the, um, into taking up more space. So they're thicker. Um, fluid channels are formed be through the protective matrix so that they can get nutrients into them and they can pass waste products out um, and they can directly communicate with each other. Microbes disperse from the colony to spread and colonize other tooth surfaces. So dispersion is stage five. 
you can see that here's the mushroom shaped colony and it opens up and these microbes are free and they are free floating and they float around and they can come back around and reattach themselves. So even if you disrupted only some of this, like say you uh, brush but you don't floss, and you've still got this going on interproximally because you didn't floss, these microbes can be dispersed back out into the saliva, into the curricular fluid, and they can start reattaching themselves too. This is a picture, pretend like the tooth is laying down. Here's the enamel surface, here's the root surface, and here's the gingiva around it. This would be the sulcus or pocket area in this case. These are your gram positive, your good bacteria. Notice that they are super gingival. They are sitting on top of the tooth surface. They're attached to the tooth. They're harmless bacteria or relatively harmless bacteria. Then you've got all of these bad bacteria. These are the ones that are coming in and they're going into the sulcus or the um, pocket area. They're attaching themselves to the, going to attach themselves to the root surface. They're also going to attach themselves to the gum tissue. And you can see in this illustration, these bacteria are still attached to the enamel, but these bacteria are attaching to them or bridging to them, and they're going into the gingival tissue. They are going to cause this irritation to this gingival tissue. Bacteria can attach subgingively by three ways. They can attach to the tooth, the epithelial lining, or to other bacteria. So in this case, bacteria can attach to the tooth, the lining of the gingiva, or they can attach just to each other and hang out. Bacteria attached to the tooth. This is a picture of bacteria attached to the tooth. Um, from the gingival margin to the junctional epithelium. So they are in the gingival sulcus or pocket. They can invade dentinal tubules in the cementum. And cocci and rods dominate tooth associated biofilms. So this is a tooth associated biofilm. In other words, it can be stuck to the enamel or the cementum, but it's stuck to the tooth surface, not the tissue. And these are some of the bacteria that do that. Then we can have a bacteria attached to epithelium. So in this case, the bacteria are attached to the epithelium. And um, you can see that um, there's different types. See, so we've got different shaped bacteria representing different types. Um, we've got larger numbers of spirochetes, flagellated bacteria, and gram-negative cocci and rods. So the gram-positive are the better bacteria. Gram-negative are the the more destructive bacteria you find in periodontal diseases. Um, they can invade the gingival connective tissue and connective tissues on the surface of the alveolar bone. So you can see how they've invaded here into the connective tissue. So these are like the little football players that have gotten through the line of scrimmage and they're going back here and they're heading for the quarterback. And here they are attacking the alveolar bone. These are some of the more powerful bacteria. Again, you've got your Porphyrmonas gingivalis, Prevotella intermedia, your Tanarella, Fusobacterium. It's just another illustration of how these bacteria are in their little mushroom formations. They've got their little outer protective coating. These bacteria are attached to the gingiva in the pocket or sulcus. And then we have all these little free floaters that have either broken loose or they were always free floaters. Um, but if they've broken loose, they can go back around and they can start all over with reattachment. There are five main hypotheses on the role of oral biofilms in periodontal disease. You have your nonspecific plaque hypothesis, which says the amount of bacteria um, this is a, a quan quantity over quality. So more bacteria leads to more disease. Nonspecific plaque. So in other words, they're saying it doesn't matter what type of bacteria, but the number of bacteria give it strength. The specific says the opposite, that it doesn't 
it isn't so much how many of the bacteria, but how potent are the bacteria? Are they the gram negative um, red complex bacteria that are attacking, or are they going to stay the um, purple gram positive bacteria? Um, you can have fewer gram negative be more destructive than lots of gram positives. Ecologic plaque hypothesis says a shift in the local environment changes the microbial composition. So a shift in the local environment might be like a change in the pH or um, a change in the amount of curricular fluid that can encourage or change the microbial composition. And then you've got the microbial homeostasis, which says a shift from beneficial to pathologic bacteria initiates an uncontrolled host response. Um, so we know it does trigger a host response. Um, there are two ways that the bacteria can become destructive. Remember, there's the direct, where the bacteria themselves um, go through the sulcus like they did in this, in this um, picture here, and they start destroying the bone and the gingival tissues themselves. Or they can cause destruction in an indirect way where they trigger the host response. And when they trigger the host response and these immune cells come into the picture, they attach themselves to the bacteria. And when they attach themselves to the, um, the bacterial wall of a gram negative bacteria, they cause the release of those endotoxins. And those endotoxins combined with the um, um, enzymes that are released by the immune cells themselves when they die um, cause direct or indirect destruction to the to the periodontal structures. And then we've got this keystone pathogen hypothesis that even low levels of pathogens can have a significant impact and initiate an uncontrolled host response. So it kind of combines a few of those different hypotheses where it says you can have a low level of pathogens, but they can be really strong pathogens that initiate a really strong that would be like in your aggressive periodontal diseases where you have some bacteria that cause that are really bad and they cause a really exaggerated response. This is something called Sokransky's microbial complexes. They have lumped these bacteria into colors based on how or groups based on how destructive they are. Your orange and your red. Um, are ma major etiologic agents of periodontal disease. They're your really powerful gram negative bacteria, red complex bacteria. Then you've got your yellow, your green, your blue, and your purple, which are all these right here, and they are your not so destructive. They, um, they can survive okay in health. So what do we believe? Clinically, healthy periodontal tissue maintains a highly ordered, mild state of subclinical inflammation. So you're going to have, you can have a mild um, amount of subclinical or not noticeable um, inflammation. Clinical diseased periodontal tissue exhibits marked histopathologic changes characterized by disordered state of severe inflammation. So as the disease becomes more progressed um, and more clinically visible, you see there's more severe inflammation. And a shift from beneficial microbes to pathogenic community triggers a potent, a potent um, host inflammatory response which contributes to tissue destruction. So shifting from good bacteria to bad bacteria triggers your host response and contributes to tissue destruction. And that concludes chapter 13.